All right, I think I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and get us started so you're not sitting here waiting. Somehow waiting on Zoom always feels even worse than waiting in person does, so I don't want to keep you all too much. Uh, uh, welcome. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, for those of you who haven't met before, my name is Matt Bell. I'm a professor of creative writing at Arizona State University. I'm also the director of the new World Building Initiative that we're launching this semester, um, of which you are now a part. So thank you so much for, for being here and joining us today. Um, this is our second workshop of the series this semester, so we're just kind of getting going. Um, before we begin tonight, I want to thank our ASU partners, including the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and the Department of English, and especially the Lincoln Center for Applied Ethics, where this initiative is housed. Um, and Karina Fitzgerald and Jan Long, who are both on the Zoom tonight and helping run it, who really do a lot of the behind the scenes work to make this happen. So thanks so much to Karina and Jan, who will be um, helping out tonight. Uh, I'm going to just talk really briefly about sort of the world building initiative as a whole. This is, uh, comes out of a world building for science fiction and fantasy class that I've been teaching for a couple of years here at ASU. That's been uh, a lot of fun, really kind of engaging student interest in genre writing, as well as sort of thinking about the ways that imagined futures and imagined worlds invite us to think about how our own world could be different, how our own world could be made better, um, kind of engaging in that sort of um, forward thinking, sort of future making thought together. The initiative is a chance to hopefully bring other kinds of people into the kind of work we're doing there uh, across the humanities at ASU and also outside of it. As you can see, so many of the people in the chat are coming from other places. And it's really exciting to have you all here. Um, I would say one of the uh, kind of core principles for me was that I wanted this to be very inclusive inside ASU as well. So we have speakers this uh, semester from uh, every school in the humanities, and we also have people from every rank in uh, in the humanities as well. So we've had grad student speakers already. We have people who have been tenured professors here for a long time. We have people who are new professors or people who are working as lecturers. Um, it's really important to me that everybody be included. There's so much good thought and good work being done at ASU, and it's our pleasure to really get to bring those things together. Um, just to give you an idea of the sort of run of show tonight, we're going to begin with two presentations that I'll introduce in just a moment. Uh, they'll both be 12 to 15 minutes talking about uh, one sports and games kind of separately and uh, probably some crossover. Uh, then we'll take about 10 minutes. We'll have a quick Q&A. So if you have questions as we're sort of listening, um, we can use the hand raise function. You can come on video or put them in the chat when that time comes. We'll have a couple of minutes for that. And then we will have a world building exercise that I'll come back and lead where we'll all get to do a little invention together. And there'll also be some time to share that with each other. Um, so we're looking probably at about 75 minutes altogether. And we'll try to keep it at that time. Um, I also say, like for those of you who are joining us online, obviously I'd appreciate if you kept your uh, mic muted, but you are welcome to leave your video on if you'd like to uh, appear and see each other. And I also hope you'll take advantage of the chat throughout the night. Um, one of the, I think the best things about Zoom really is the chat that allows us to sort of comment and encourage or be excited or, or add things to what people are saying. Um, so I hope you'll feel free to use that as a respectful space to sort of interact throughout the night so you don't feel like you're just being uh, lectured at by us. Um, okay, I think that's enough housekeeping. Let me move a slide forward here and introduce tonight's world builders. Um, our first speaker is going to be Victoria Jackson, PhD, who is a sports historian and leads the sports humanities at Arizona State University. Jackson writes and speaks about the intersection of sport and society, exploring how the games we play and watch tell us much about the communities, local, national, and global in which we live. Her writing has appeared in the Los Angeles Times, Washington Post, Boston Globe, Chronicle of Higher Ed, Slate, Letras Libris, El Universal, Ipaca, The Independent, The Athletic, and Sportico. Jackson has appeared on 60 Minutes to discuss American college sports as a frequent podcast, radio, TV, and documentary film commentator. She brings a historian's eye to the project of designing future sports systems that are inclusive, equitable, and just. Jackson is an NCAA national champion and retired professional runner, and she would like for her ASU school record in the 5,000 meters to be broken ASAP. I'll admit to after looking at this bio of looking up that record and just, you know, kind of uh, gauging, but I'm not going to be even close. So someone else will have to take that up. Um, second will be Dr. Jeffrey Holmes, who's an instructor of film and media studies at ASU. His work focuses on issues of agency and new forms of teaching and learning in video games and other digital media. 
He is a faculty advisor for the Infinity Game Lab and the Video Game Development Club at ASU. He has also advised UNESCO, the Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Peace and Sustainable Development, Pearson Education, the Sydney Public Library, and numerous game and numerous game companies on the use and limits of video games to teach and engage the world. Um, I'm so excited that Victoria and Jeff are here with us tonight. I'm going to put my PowerPoint down and let Victoria take it from here. Um, thank you all again for being here. Okay, well, thank you so much, Matt. That was a very generous introduction. I'm really excited for this opportunity and to be here with all you world builders. I'm just gonna get my PowerPoint up and running. All right. So I, as suggested by my bio, <laughs> am not a fiction writer, but I do spend a lot of time exploring ideas while running. And I see sports as performance art. Uh, a creative expressive endeavor alone or in a group like music or dance. And my hope is that what I have to share about sports and play and power, um, or at least some of what I share, <laughs> is useful for you world builders out there. I believe deeply in the power of sport to help people find their power and to spark transformation in communities. And sport has been horizon expanding for me. Uh, in many different ways, both literal and figurative, and also as an athlete and as a historian. So I didn't know I was going to take sport seriously, um, and that that was a thing that I could do. But my athlete journey led me to realizing how seriously the world took sport and that there was a lot of potential to use sport to kind of unveil and unleash things about society that that you can't really get at in any way better than through a sporting lens. So from an athlete perspective, how power and performance and play can lead to self and community discoveries. And from a historian perspective, what historians contribute to building and imagining futures, turns out we do have something to contribute and understanding contexts. I think that's what we bring to the table is that that's our jam. <laughs> Complexity and context is our jam. Um, and, and explaining the contexts in which institutions emerge. So context here again is key. What are the forces, ideas, structures that are reflected in influence and are influenced by sports? So I am gonna let Jordan Childs, first I'm gonna mute her, and then I'm gonna let her do her thing while I talk about sport as a space apart. Sport is this space for imagining new ways of being, for tapping into a broader range of emotions and behaviors, for testing our limits, for pushing with teammates, for trying hard and failing hard. It's a space for pretending. I imagine that when Jordan Childs is putting on her uniform, it's like she's putting on a new role. She's adopting a new persona. And that persona is fearless and courageous. And that allows her to practice being fearless and courageous. A shy person may be able to do incredibly brave, vulnerable, risky things in a sporting space. And so the power of sport here is for self-discovery and knowledge, because we can take what we do practicing in this space and apply it to other places in the world too. Trying to remember how to advance out of a video. <laughs> there we go. So the, there's power in sport for self-discovery, and there's also power in sport for community discovery and growth. Sport holds the potential for people to come together to achieve what once was considered impossible with shared belief and commitment to a shared stretch goal. And even if that goal technically isn't achieved, the journey is the thing of value. And the journey is the generator of countless lessons to be carried forward in life. Self-discovery and community discovery are the foundational stones of the power of sport. But I also want to talk about play. And I want us all to think for a moment of what it was like to be a kid. And maybe you do this more than I do, but I have a kid, so I'm doing it more frequently. What games did you play? Recess games, neighborhood games, imagination games, alone or with friends. Where are you? The playground, a park, the woods, neighborhood streets, a lake, a pool. What were the feelings? The range of emotions. How did your body feel? 
how did you feel in your body? I often get asked what sports I did as a kid. And when I instead talk about playing capture the flag in the ravine or long summer days of riding bikes and swimming at the lake, I can tell people's eyes start to glaze over. But going on a kayaking trip in the Apostle Islands and Lake Superior, exploring snowmobile trails on long runs in the north woods of Wisconsin, or playing Manhunt, a game kids in my town created, which was basically just like a huge game of tan that a uh, game of tag that took over our whole town. Like these were the things that were foundational and important to my development development into an athlete and human. And they gave me more space to dream and feel power in my body, more so than you know, playing junior high basketball or AYSO soccer games, even though those were important in my life and my development too, I'd say the latter, the organized sports were less so. So if we're thinking about kids, it's this organic, unstructured, unsupervised play, right? Kids are agreeing upon rules, but they're dynamic rules because they're constantly coming together and changing them like mid game and that's totally fine and it's totally democratic and somehow they figured that all out and they're super creative and performance and the movement and the joy. Like kids are super awesome imaginators. We have these shared play spaces in public for adults too, but most of these play spaces are no really longer, they're, they're not really public spaces in American society any longer with the exception of schools or spaces for kids. And these huge public play spaces were sites of community fighting actually, um, fighting and reconciliation. Having shared sites of conflict, it seems, was actually healthy, a mechanism for preventing polarization and intervention to impede the finding of and sticking with the like-minded, forcing interaction with others you might not seek out on your own. So this sort of wide-reaching community creation, instead of splintering into sub-communities, is messy. It takes a lot of work. And sports have long been championed as spaces for people from different backgrounds to come together with shared goals and learn they have more in common than they ever could have realized. So I think the, the trope here is the desegregation of school and school sports, the sports being the front lines of conflict resolution and inclusive belonging, and not just in superficial ways. There's all sorts of stories that illustrate this power of sport to bring people together. And the narrative arc with the overcoming of an obstacle and coming together to achieve a goal makes for good cinematic tales on the big screen. Fandom is another site of community building that we have in sport, of course. But, you know, rather than thinking of fans as kind of passive consumers, they transform into active participants through the sharing of songs and rituals and behaviors. Um, and, you know, the expansion of emotional range that we see with fans is part of the, the power and the potential in sport, too. You know, there's not really anywhere else in society where crying in public is perfectly acceptable or even encouraged or like the strong bear hugging of a stranger, like you can't really get away with that in other spaces. So the expansion of the arrange that we, emotions that we can tap, to, tap into in communities makes community bonds and institutions stronger as well. And we're gonna just very briefly go into history mode because the organized sports our societies play together emerged in a particular historical context. And, you know, I pose this class when I teach, I teach a sports and U.S. history class that is really, it's a trick, it's using sport to teach the second half of the U.S. history survey. And it's no coincidence that all of our modern sporting forms are emerging in a particular historical context, which is the late 19th century. It's, it's the kind of collision of all of these historical forces coming together that you know, means baseball and basketball and volleyball and football and soccer and tennis and squash and cricket. All of these sport, sporting forms are emerging in this moment. And it's British imperialists who are spreading them around the globe. And it's the enlightenment and ideas about um, improving the body and progress that are allowing people to take sports and run with them is kind of seen as a good thing. And of course, industrialization. So the rules in these sporting forms are reflecting the new organization and obsession with the clock. Attention to the clock is new, and we see that built into the games that we play. So historical context really matters when we're talking about the emergence of modern sports. With that, you know, are the things that historians call the modern order and control, bureaucratization, scientific management, standardization, governing bodies and regulation, rules, 
that aren't laws, but organizations with police powers and benefiting from the perception of violations illegality. The work play binary and the creation of leisure time, applying the lessons of the shop room floor to optimize the game, specialization by position, the drawing of plays, um, socioeconomic class stratification that comes with industrialization and ideas about playing sports the right way, the gentleman amateur. So ideas of exclusivity are built into modern sports. Modern sport was a political project reflecting and influencing broader society. The first political project of modern sport was a project of exclusivity. It's the sons of the political business and military elite who are playing these games on the elite college campuses of Harvard and Yale and Princeton. So there's a particular project behind these sports as they're emerging. And they're embodied really well by Teddy Roosevelt, who the strenuous life, you know, and there's a there's a worry, there's an anxiety in this class of men who are worried their sons are becoming emasculated. They can't go fight in a civil war. They can't go fight on the, I'm using air quotes here, frontier, but they can play a violent, aggressive sport and develop the qualities necessary of young men fit to lead the world's races by playing a dangerous, violent sport like football. And it was very dangerous and violent in the late 19th century. Teddy Roosevelt's son, while he was playing at Harvard, got his nose broken. So manliness ideology is a product of modern sport and it influences the sports and who gets to play them. It's also a white supremacist ideology that is built and baked into modern sports in this moment. It's why in a Southern context, an attempt to recreate the, the racial hierarchy of a slavery era is so much part of the attempt to recreate that racial hierarchy in a Jim Crow era with my white men placed at the top again. And it's no coincidence that football fields are where we see white men trying to affirm that status at the top of the social hierarchy and why we see so many Confederate flags in, in white Southern college football. So the second political project of modern sport is inclusivity. And of course, all throughout those who are pushed out have fought to play. Um, if we're thinking about women historically and to tools of liberal uh, uh, liberation, books, education, cars, mobility, and sports, ownership of body, using one's body for one's own power and pleasure is a radical thing. Um, and that joy and movement and freedom and power, of course, political women in the 19 teens and 20s who are advocating for the vote and being in public and going to work are also playing sports. These are radical ideas and there is much resistance to women riding bicycles or playing basketball and descriptions of the craze with which women are taking them up because yikes, how gross is it to the male gaze when women are using their bodies and sweating and straining and ew, they can't even keep their emotions from bubbling over when they play sports. But of course, we can't control, our, can't control ourselves if we see an exposed ankle, but never mind that part. Men work really, really, really hard to make sports for men. The Olympics, the modern Olympics launched in the 1890s, all dudes. FIFA, global soccer, all dudes for nearly a century. The NCAA, all dudes for 75 years. And I'll um, skip over these next two slides, but you know, global football is soccer football and it's wildly popular among women and it's wildly popular as a spectator sport. So Boxing Day, 1920, 53,000 people come out to watch Dick Kerr's ladies play. 14,000 people are outside because they don't have tickets to get in. And less than six weeks later, the Football Association bans women from soccer pitches for the next 50 years. And last summer, England won the Euros, and they used, leveraged that moment to try to make sports for all by writing a letter to the prime minister saying, girls cannot play soccer in schools. Can you please pass a law to make sure they get equal access? And the British government said, no, soccer's for boys. So the second political project of inclusivity is still ongoing. The hosting of a sports mega event, of course, is like a technicolor revealing of the politics and geopolitics of sport. We saw this most recently with the Qatar Men's World Cup, 
but host cities leaning into the hosting of mega events for political purposes has always been part of modern sports. Solidifying political power internally and cracking down on dissent, like in Mexico City and the thousands of people killed in the lead up to those Olympic Games. Um, achievement of geopolitical and global business aims are the goal. We in Mexico are open for business. The world can come here and Mexico is ready for you to come and do business here. Athletes have power to use the space of sports too, rather than to simply be used by sports and others for their political purposes. And thus, while working on that second political project of modern sport, making it inclusive, a third emerges, using sport to transform the world. So pictured here um, on the right, of course, is Tommy Smith and John Carlos, the podium protest moment. But this in its origins was a boycott movement and an organization called the Olympic Project for Human Rights that had local goals, national goals, and global goals. This was an anti-apartheid organization. They were advocating for fair housing in San Jose, California, and they were trying to make national sports organizations inclusive in their membership policies in the United States, most of which had been barring African Americans and Jewish Americans. They had a blind spot, which was that the OPHR was only men and black women were protesting in Mexico City as well. So pictured here on the bottom is Wyoming Atias, who protested in Mexico City by wearing black shorts in her races. The woman in the headshot on the top is Rose Robinson. She's the first athlete we know of to protest during the playing of a national anthem to hold the country up to its democratic principles and ideals because she was not a full citizen of the country. And pictured on the right here is Wilma Rudolph, who became so radicalized by the trips that Wyoming Atias is pictured doing here, State Department goodwill campaigns going to Africa and saying, Black Americans have it great. <laughs> That it's not that they return home to second class citizenship. Don't listen to those Russians. Wilma Rudolph became so radicalized by that that she went home to get involved in grassroots politics and joined SNCC. To this day, using that sports space to advocate for both change within sports and in broader society is um, being taken on by black women. So they've taken the baton from the Wyoming Atiases and the Wilma Rudolphs. Pictured on the right is Alicia Montano, who competed in the Olympic trials eight months pregnant to showcase that it was healthy for women to exercise, both for mom and baby, while they're pregnant. And then a year later, showed that women who have children can still be world-class athletes. She won the same USA championships to qualify for the world championships. And she took on Nike, um, as did Allison Felix pictured here for punishing and penalizing women for becoming pregnant and suspending their contracts. Allison Felix almost died during childbirth, as did Serena Williams, and both of them are now using their notoriety as athletes to advocate for more attention to Black maternal mortality rates. So first political project of modern sport, exclusivity. Second, inclusivity. Third, using the power of sport to create social transformation. Sport punches above its weight because it is a space of power and power plays that are recognizable and respected. Sports hold power because athletes' bodies hold power to transform ideas about bodies. Ideas about bodies play out most explicitly on the bodies of athletes. And this means athletes hold the deepest knowledge and sharpest critiques to debunk ideas or expand ideas of what is imaginable. So if we are building new sporting worlds, we have to be mindful of the ideas, the virtues, the values of the moment, the contexts of the moment, and their influence on our imaginations as we build. And, and that's it from me. Thank you so much, Victoria. I'll talk over you while you uh, while you stop sharing your screen. I was busy taking notes, so I had to. I needed a second. Um, that was fantastic. It was really a pleasure to get to hear you present, and I love that idea of keeping in in mind the the virtues, the values, and the context of the present as we as we think about our how sport should be and the other ways in which we um, compete and interact with each other. It's really fantastic. So thank you so much for that.
Um, I'm going to turn these over to Jeff in short order. So Jeff, uh, whenever you're ready, feel free to begin. Uh, sure. Thanks so much. And uh, thank you all for, for joining here. Let me uh, see if I can share this properly. Always a good, good time with Zoom, as we all know. Looks like everything's working uh, all right, I hope. Okay, good, good, great. Uh, so this actually uh, uh, dovetails very nicely with, with what Victoria was talking about, and in particular about the, the spirit of play. Um, so uh, as you know, those sort of uh, you know, introductions that we do um, uh, mention, I'm, I'm an instructor in film and media studies. So I look at, at video games in particular and other forms of digital media as uh, uh, pieces of media uh, but the really interesting thing, and, and the way that I think makes uh, the, the little presentation I'm about to give make a little more sense is, is games in particular are also sets of practices. Um, so they're objects the way you might, you know, treat um, um, a movie or a play you're watching or a sculpture, perhaps, you know, they're, they're designed and made by, by people. Uh, but play is also an enactment of things. It's an enactment of rules. It's an enactment of freedom, all kinds of things like that. So thinking about uh, games in particular as, as both objects that we can structure and, and, and poke at and explore, uh, but also things we do uh, and things we do with each other, at each other, for each other. Um, and so, so understanding that sort of dichotomy, I think, is really, really useful. And, and again, um, like Victoria mentioned, this, that's the, the, the childlike spirit that we, we take on play um, really influences kind of what I'm going to uh, talk about here and also the kind of challenge that I, I, I want to sort of uh, put out there to the, to the world builders out there in, in this presentation. So we'll see what that means. Um, uh, there's at least one former student of mine in, in chat uh, and maybe more. Uh, as you know, I can go 20 minutes and not even say my name. So instead, I think the, the most useful thing to do is I want to give you a, a worked example, a specific example um, to talk about how we can design for play, but what happens when we sort of give control over to the players themselves. And that example is going to come from World of Warcraft, um, which is uh, a, a digital video game. It was originally released in, in 2004. They've been subsequently milking this thing for 20 years. It's among the most popular uh, online video games in the world, still millions of players. Um, you know, as... as uh, you know, time uh, progresses and we learn more about the development and the production of it. Blizzard, the company, has some, some real problems, but the game itself is a really interesting sort of space for players. Uh, and if you're not familiar with World of Warcraft, um, essentially it's a game uh, in which you uh, create a little character who's going to be your stand-in, your avatar. Uh, and it takes place in sort of a high fantasy realm, a little Tolkien-esque. There are elves and dwarves and, and blood elves and goblins and all kinds of stuff. And there's a, you know... A, a whole bunch of quests and 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 world building uh, done within the game. It's a fantastical kind of place uh, where you go and you explore, you fight, you discover things, you collect things, and and um, you know have a good time. And and the the purpose, if you were going to outline, you know, what's the purpose or what's the point of World of Warcraft? Ultimately, it's a game about progression. You start as a level one. Uh, kind of character with very basic equipment and very basic skills and stuff. And over time, you develop into a stronger character. You get more armor and better statistics. You're stronger, you're faster, you have more health, you can do more damage, all those things. Uh, and so, you know, like other role-playing games, it certainly is, you know, kind of fantasy-based. It's a power fantasy about how you can sort of, you know, if you just work hard enough, you can get better and stronger and, and these types of things. Um, but, you know, as players put in thousands, hundreds, thousands, I can't tell you, well, I will tell you, I have over 5,000 hours in that game. Uh, and uh, as a retired, I've not played in years and years and years, but the, a lot of, and, and technically that was research. It was uh, for my, my master. So, you know, it counts. Uh, but, you know, you, you, you uh, play this game uh, repeatedly in order to sort of grow your character and grow your experience and feel uh, for the world that they're, that they're building, this uh, set of stories they're telling. Uh, the other really important thing about World of Warcraft is that it's multiplayer. It's a massively multiplayer online game. And when you're playing World of Warcraft, you are playing with hundreds to thousands of other people on your specific server. There are millions of people uh, in the world playing this video game and stuff. And so when you log in, uh, you are often playing alongside other people in this world. world. You're sharing this space. And when you log out, the world actually continues. Other players can keep playing. Things keep happening, and if you log, you know, log out for a month and come back, the world might be a little different. 
Uh, but the multiplayer aspect is really this sort of key um, element of, of a game like World of Warcraft. You're playing with other people. In fact, if it's a game about sort of progressing your character, um, becoming more uh, powerful and getting better gear and stuff, you actually can't get to end game content, the best gear and the best abilities without cooperating with other players. Uh, there are quests in the world. You go out and, you know, do do things. But to get the best stuff, the best armor and the best weapons and the best sort of things, uh, you need to work with other players, groups of five, 10, or even 40 players to get the highest and the best gear possible. So if you want to continue playing in this world and you want to be the best sort of player you can be, you need to work with other players. And the way uh, the game is designed to promote this is uh, what they call the Holy Trinity. Uh, and I'll break that down for you here a little bit. So in, in this game, and to get the best kind of, of, of gear and, and stuff, you need to defeat the sort of top end bosses. They're very, very powerful. They've got tons of abilities and health and other things. And a single player who is playing this game can't defeat, it is impossible to defeat these bosses by themselves. It's too many, too many points. They do too much damage and stuff. So what it requires is for different players with different skills and abilities to cooperate and work together. They form this, this, this triangle, again, referred to as sort of the Holy Trinity, in which one player, one group of players absorbs all the damage that the, 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 end, the boss enemy is doing. Uh, another player is healing up and making sure everyone stays, stays alive. And, and a third set is dealing the type of damage you need to do to defeat this enemy. And so to take on a boss, to get to the sort of end of the game, so to speak, and get the best kind of stuff, you need to work together. It's a game that's been designed specifically to allow for what the business world or, or the military might call a cross-functional team. People with disparate sets of skills who need to cooperate together. We see this in sports too, right? Football is a great example of that. Different players have different abilities and stuff, and it takes all of them to win. And, and importantly, it takes cooperation. You don't uh, fight against each other, you fight with each other. And this is, importantly, by design, been put together in such a way that it needs you to cooperate. So the world that they've structured through the design of these systems, uh, it promotes this kind of cooperation, this shared uh, effort, this shared goal, and, and the sort of you know, uh, work it takes to, to accomplish this kind of thing. Uh, and so we might be able to talk about a game like World of Warcraft and the world that it builds and the play that it kind of promotes as a kind of designed play. Um, the kinds of rules, the kinds of systems and mechanics that go into it um, which structure you know, experiences for players, the kinds of things they get out of it. And I want to really specifically highlight this word structure. This is a really important one because in these designs, they're promoting certain ways of playing and excluding other ways of playing. And so uh, I want to I want to poke at that one a little bit more because this is where it gets especially again interesting. And and Victoria, you mentioned that that manhunter game or like kids playing on a playground. This is this is that's a perfect analogy for for this part of it. So um, as all of us who have been on Zoom calls or trying to organize <laughs> game nights or, or work meetings or anything, getting 40 people together online at a, at a specific time to do a dungeon to take on that boss is challenging. And people are, if you're relying on your tank to you know, absorb all that damage and they're running 15 or 20 minutes late or their computer is fried and they're trying to restart it or something like that, there's a lot of waiting around. Uh, you often find yourself in the world of World of Warcraft waiting for other people. And as players discover this was a regular thing, you know, they'd play every Thursday night with their guild and the, the one guy was always late ah, and stuff like that. This, this, this practice emerged from people in this world. Uh, this practice is what I is referred to as the naked gnome race. Uh, and it goes more or less like this. As people were waiting, what they would do is they would start a brand new character and was a gnome, a little level one gnome. And uh, for some reason, in fact, maybe one of the most interesting reasons is they would take their clothes off. They would get naked. Uh, and then <laughs> what they would do is they would run to the nearest uh, like capital city. Uh, so here's an example. Here's a bunch of naked gnomes running and it's just a little race and whoever got there first, um, you know, sometimes for bragging rights, guilds would use it for, you know, whoever... Uh, one would get the best loot or the most sort of money to, to drop or something like that. They would use it as a, a, a tool to help them. Or sometimes it was just people goofing off. And the, the, this, poor little, this poor little fellow all by himself. Um, and so the, the naked gnome race became 
this incredibly regularized practice that 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 hundreds and thousands of people would do on the regular. They're waiting for their guildmate on Thursday night, naked gnome race, boom. There's a Wikipedia, you know, article entry on it. It became a, a, a cultural practice for players. It was something that was never intended by the designers necessarily. They didn't want you, you know, <laughs> taking the clothes off your gnomes and running around, but they built a space which allowed those things. And importantly, they built a space which you couldn't damage these other people. Because as you imagine, as we already saw once in this call, even people will come in and troll and grief and do all kinds of stuff. And so if, if you could roll this character and, and, and uh, you could just punch out all the other characters, right, it would just be chaos, right? But those, those limitations were actually in there. And so by having those limits, they actually encouraged this kind of play to emerge from these systems. Uh, and so you can think about this as a kind of emergent play, that it's what happens when you give players a controller, what happens when you give kids a stick outside, they'll think of something. Uh, and, you know, if you give them enough space and enough sticks and enough things, they'll probably come up with all kinds of things. Importantly, I want to highlight this part. Often these things are unintended. They're not necessarily in, in, in anticipated by the designers. They may not be intended and maybe even contrary to what uh, the designers want you to do um, speed runners, you know, who use glitches in games or hackers uh, or you know, trolls or griefers who are, who are breaking the game for players. Any Grand Theft Auto players out there understand playing GTA online is a nightmare <laughs> of hackers trying to ruin your day. Uh, and so these systems are in place to encourage and discourage types of play. But in, in when thinking about things like games as forms of media, when thinking about play as an activity, um, you can do a lot to help structure play, to give, you know, again, rules and systems and goals and a win state and all those kinds of things that go into a game that help people say, okay, we agree to, to work together and play the game of baseball or something. You throw the ball, I'll hit it. Uh, but often, again, they'll come up with all kinds of other stuff. I'm going to see who can hit this ball the farthest. Oh, and whoever hits it further gets... Gets a drink at the end. I don't know. You know what? Because people will people. Uh, you know, the, the the first rule of any of these things is that people will people. Uh, and so when when thinking about how to then, uh, uh, and so when thinking about how to build worlds, especially when thinking about in a playful kind of sense, I want to sort of put a, a kind of challenge maybe that might help um, transition to the to the activity that Matt has planned and and just maybe something to keep in in the back of your mind for for building worlds in a kind of playful kind of way, especially games, but, you know, other kinds of games. So think about ways that we, you can design for this kind of emergent play. Um, the first is, is to think about, well, what do you want to happen? You know, what do you want them to know? Or what do you want them to experience? What's the thing you're sort of aiming for, um, for that world you're building? Whether that's a story, whether that's a game, whether that's a, a presentation you're giving to a bunch of people on Zoom, right? Uh, and then you have to think, well, what, what might people do when I hand over control? Games are really about control and handing control over to players. They enact things and come up with their own things. So what might possibly happen within this space that I've, I've designed and created? What, might, what other things might appear? Uh, George Lucas loves this because he gets to cash every check for everyone who ever came up with a great idea in his universe. Right? Uh, and so designing a space which can encourage those kinds of things becomes really useful. In fact, you can think about as a designer, uh, what kinds of opportunities can you give for this kind of creative, agentic play? Um, you know, human, again, humans love the humans. We love to find patterns. We love to play games. We love to do, these are like inherent biological urges within us. Um, can you structure a space which helps promote these kinds of things? It gives opportunities for play. Uh, and then on the flip side, of course, especially for, for you know, folks who want to tell some kind of specific story or specific kind of experience, um, what's important to protect in that world? What's the, what's the core thing you really want them to understand? Uh, and how can you uh, design defensively? Uh, so the World of Warcraft example is, is a pretty good one of this. Again, if, if they allowed player any player to do damage to another player, the naked gnome race probably would not happen. Um, they designed a system in which you cannot damage another player who's on your, your side, the alliance and the horde, the, the two sides, right? Uh, and so anyone on your side, you can't damage. You can't do any kind of real interaction with those. And so by limiting, by, by having a limit to the types of interactions and the types of damage you can do to types of players, um, they've actually then built this system, which encourages these other forms of play. Uh, so thinking about how to design defensively also can be a really useful way to thinking about, you know, how to how to protect and promote certain things within your world. To answer that that question at the top, well, you know, what might happen and how do you get it to be the thing you want to happen uh, is also a really important thing. So thinking in terms of that defensive design can be really useful.
Uh, and with that, um, I will uh, hand it back over. All right. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was really fantastic. Um, really, really interesting all the ways that both your presentations sort of spoke to each other. And I, I really appreciate that. Um, one of the one of the sort of uh, design principles of these workshops has been that I just have been trying to invite good people and then setting them free. So I never really know what people are going to say until they say it. So it's always really nice when they come together so well. So thank you both so much for that. Um, we do have just like a couple of minutes. If someone has a question they'd like to ask Jeff or Victoria or both, um, you can either use like the raise hand icon that's under reaction. You can put it in the chat. Um, we don't have like a ton of time, but we have a little bit. And I'd, I'd really like you to be able to if you'd like to. The hardest thing is always the first question and the last one, right? You know? <laughs> yeah, Jared, go ahead. If you want to, you can unmute yourself and, and say hi if you'd like. Hello. Um, just heads up, my Zoom video isn't working, so apologies. But um, uh, I love both your presentations, first off. I just wanted to ask, um, I know from the way I guess it was described, Victoria, and I guess with you as well, Jeff, you both like seem to be more in your writing more on a nonfiction basis. But would you say that world building uh, outside of your presentations, would you say world building also is an important part of your own writings, especially in context that isn't science fiction or fantastical? Mm -hmm. Would you say that Sport, the sports would be a good example of world building within the confines of more general literature or nonfiction. Um, I'll, I'll go first, Jeff, if that's cool. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. I, I never knew a historian could be involved in policy <laughs> hmm. or write like white papers. Um, and I spent, I spent, I do some, all my writings for public and I write for media outlets and I do a lot of explainer pieces. Like, so college sports are a hot mess right now. Tell us how and why we got here, right? And it could be for a US audience or it's more fun when it's for an audience outside the US because then you get to be in the mind blowing business because <laughs> if you step outside of the US, American college sports is insane. <laughs> Um, especially that, you know, a disproportionately black football and basketball labor force isn't getting paid and their coaches are making tens of millions of dollars and it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And to explain all of that and, oh, no, they get a priceless education and sometimes there's academic fraud in exchange. Um, it's, it's very easy to blow minds when you're explaining that to people outside the U.S. Um, but that I, I started getting... Um, actually from our Dean of the college, Pat Kenny, he'd be like, okay, so what do we do about it, Victoria? Like, you can say why all of this is bad, <laughs> but how are we gonna make it better? And that really got to me, it stuck with me. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna start doing some policy stuff. And it turns out like explaining unintended consequences and, and showing that they're actually obvious and that you can see them <laughs> in the moment and anticipate them is a good way of thinking about designing and trying to optimize policy in a future looking way. So that that's the sort of work I'm doing now, almost exclusively um, thinking about how to build a better American collegiate system that's more equitable and just, um, and also um, redesigning the mess that is the Olympic movement alongside of that. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just sure. tack on if you, if you don't mind. Um, I, yeah, I, that's a great question and a really important one. Um, and at the risk of, of sounding a little little trite, um, my my academic background is actually in rhetoric. Um, so I was trained as a to do argumentation and, and stuff. And you know, all communication ultimately is a kind of world building. You have to have you know shared uh, understanding of the world and try to bring someone into your point of view or understand their own. It is itself its own form of world building, uh, but in a little more concrete you know sense. Again, I know that sounds a little you know oh, we all will world build all the time, but you know we kind of do. Uh, and so to bring it a little more concretely, I, I think world building becomes incredibly important in something like a video game, of course, because you are constructing a space. It's, you know, again, that that issue of design becomes so important. Um, not only are you constructing systems that have to make sense and goals and rules and things like that, but you need to have a, a, a place where it makes sense. So if you're playing Tetris, you know, it's pretty clear what you're doing. It's a grid and you move your things and stuff. But when you get to things like the Last of Us, or World of Warcraft, or or Mass Effect, or something like that, where where it's it's 
there's all kinds of politics at play. There's space racism happening. There's all kinds of issues at play. It needs to make sense. And so in, in the work that I do, especially, um, you know, when I think about the classes I design uh, as a way of helping students see the world of gaming in a particular way, as well as the kind of consulting that I've done, you know, just kind of professionally for, for game studios and, and others, um, having them understand that that is like a key to making a good game is, is very important. Uh, and I think it does extend, um, you know, both in, in fictive writing and, and writing creatively, uh, as well as all kinds of practices outside of that, kind of like what Victoria was mentioning. Thank you both so much. Um, there's a, a question from Richard that I think uh, I'll ask, and then we'll, we'll go on to the activity um, that I think is, is really great. Uh, Richard says, interesting that both emphasize sports and play is communal. What about sports and play for individuals who are more introverted or loners? Like how do sort of... Where, where do individuals fit into these sort of schemes that we've been talking about today? And I, I like this question too, because I'm a person who has like played World of Warcraft for like one minute. Cause I'm like, no, 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 I want to be by myself. I like <laughs> if, if If I had the mic, we'll just pass the mic back. I don't, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you want to take this too, but I'll, I'll just jump in here. Um, you know, that's a great question. And, and you know, I, I have a little, admittedly, a little bit of a chip on my shoulder about games, because culturally, when, especially when we talk about things about like video games, it's always, you know, the isolated loner nerd in their basement, you know, with their mom's basement and stuff like that. I mean, yeah, right. Yeah. I've been playing video games, uh, you know, for 40, I'm, I'm, I won't tell you how, I'm 44 years old. Uh, I've been playing games as long as I can remember. And for me, it was always about playing with my brothers and playing with the kids on my streets and, you know, playing now online i'm i'm now uh, uh, separated you know by thousands of miles from some of my family and stuff and yet we get together on discord and in, in game and stuff when we play so you know i i have a little i i'm always a little biased towards the sociability of games I, I do think they're social but even even those sort of individual practices you know when you download um you know uh, uh angry birds or something on your phone um, you know, it, it, it's an isolated, you're not necessarily working directly with, with other people you're playing for yourself, or maybe you're getting the high score or the next level or something. Uh, but even that is a kind of social interaction. The designer had something in mind that they wanted you to do, and then you pick it up and do something with it, um, it is it, like a second order social interaction. But, you know, those, those individual, you know, personal experiences are, of course, really, really important. Um, you know, The Last of Us is having a real moment right now. I brought it up, I think, already. It's on HBO is, you know, got a great show going and built on, you know, a single player game telling a really interesting story. And, and games, of course, can be like books or movies and stuff can be mediums for an individual to experience something, too. But I would always sort of veer back to this idea that that game design in particular is is a type of conversation. Uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a removed convert you're there's a designer and they make a thing and then you go pick it up and play it and you're kind of working together collaboratively and that's kind of a social practice yeah i mean that's the relationship between a novelist and the reader right i mean it's a really similar sort of idea victoria do you want to add to that as well sure um well you know there's a lot of kind of individual movement activities that you know when they are placed inside those governing bodies and competitions with rules and regulations, they become sport, but they're also sort of just individual activities, you know, the range of what that can be. And what I, you know, I'm a distance runner and with other kind of movement sports like swimming or cycling or mountain climbing or whatever, um, there is kind of a, I think a universality to folks who come out of that saying, well, I always, you know, have my best while I'm in motion. And I, I think there's something that happens where you're kind of somewhat focused on a task that is a movement task. It allows this other piece of your brain to start either taking care of business and organizing or getting super creative and problem solving or just opening up into new worlds of thinking that aren't exposed otherwise because you're tapping into endorphins and all sorts of chemicals are being released in your brain from that movement, um, from your body in motion. And um, so I, I think what's beautiful about those movement activities is they can serve so many different purposes across a lifetime for an individual. I mean, when I was, you know, in high school, like running was super social and I loved just running with friends and chatting and gossiping and telling jokes and making each other laugh. And 
now I like crave my alone time on the run because I have a mm. very talkative seven-year-old and it's like, I just need some silence. <laughs> so, um, you know, the, these are, again, from a perspective of someone who's always loved it. <laughs> so I'm biased. Yeah. Um, the gift that keeps on giving. Um, and it's wonderful to see how your relationship with that activity changes over time and the way that it serves you can change over time as well. Yeah, thank you so much, Victoria. Um, I know there are, there are other questions, but I, I do want to start our sort of activity so we have time for that as well. So um, I'm sorry if we didn't get to you here, but, um, you know, I hope our uh, brilliant public intellectuals won't mind an email or something or a tweet if you want to say hi. So please do um, feel free to reach out. Um, I'm going to uh, share my PowerPoint again and go back. Feels like we're going back like so much content. We're going back a long way. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, thinking about game design, how we can do this together is a little tricky, right? Uh, but one of the, the books I, I teach frequently in my world in class is a book called Player of Games by science fiction writer Ian M. Banks. I was trying to find my copy of Player Games. I think I borrowed it somebody. So I'm going to hold up a different Ian e. Banks book and you're going to pretend that I'm holding up the right one. Um, it's really great. Uh, when you're just in a small window, you can cheat. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the book, but I first want to just read this quote from it. Um, Ian e. M. Banks, all reality is a game. Physics at its most fundamental, the very fabric of our universe, results directly from the interaction of certain fairly simple rules and chance. The same description may be applied to the best, most elegant, and most intellectually and aesthetically satisfying games. By being unknowable, by resulting from events which at the subatomic level cannot be fully predicted, the future remains malleable and retains the possibility of change, the hope of coming to prevail, victory, to use an unfashionable word. In this, the future is a game. Time is one of the rules. Um, in, uh, in Ian Banks' novels, they all take place uh, surrounding this spacefaring cult, uh, society called the culture, which is kind of a socialist utopia in space where, you know, a lot of the sort of problems have been taken out of sort of ordinary life, or at least the way we think of problems. Um, but one of the things that happens is none of the stories take place in the culture because it's boring, because everything is good. Um, so in this book, the main character is sent to an empire called Azad, where they play this very complicated game. So this spacefaring socialist utopian goes to this uh, capitalistic, uh, um, imperialistic sort of space empire to play this, this game called Azad, which is also the name of the empire. And so Azad is this incredibly complicated game. It's played every six years by the ruling class of the empire. So I think in the book, 12,000 people play it. And through this game, they decide the social and sort of governmental rank of everybody for the next six years. Uh, the game is purposely complicated enough that a player's true sort of philosophy and political views are expressed by their play style. So to, to play well in Azad is to be like the best person at the um, those virtues, values and contexts that Victoria was talking about. Right. The person who exemplifies those things. Um, it's primarily played on these three boards, the board of origin, the board of forms and the board of becoming. The boards are so big, the players walk around, they move their pieces by hand, they interact with them. Um, and it has this increasing variety of game pieces that have been added over the years of playing it. They have counters and cards and dice, little tanks and things are moving around, resource markers. And they have uh, markers are different philosophical contexts that change the rules around them. And they have these like biological things that they've sort of invented to play the game that uh, are alive and change as the game is played. Um, and then the victor becomes emperor of Assad. So, right. So it's this sort of complicated, hyper competitive game that uh, that goes in this way. So we take a little inspiration from that. And I'll just say in another interview, Banks talked about this and how he was interested in games. And he said, morality is involved in the games we play with one another. The morality of games is the rules. Games have a very definite and set morality. You play according to the games or you don't play at all. Although Jeff might argue with that with the naked gnome race and emergency gameplay. Um, Bank says, I'm trying to make the connections between the games the society play on each other and on the individuals within those societies and the games play on the basic interpersonal level. I try to use games as symbols of the ways we react to one another and to society, um, which is what we've been talking about in some ways all night. Um, so we're going to imagine for tonight our own infinitely complex game that we are all players in, uh, a game with an incredible number of interlocking boards, not infinitely large, but often appearing to be so. Game has no set end. 
All ultimate goals are self-selected by the players, which again are you. There are many players at once in this room and elsewhere, unevenly distributed across the board. Games rules are constantly evolving based on the introduction of new game pieces and their move set. So we're about to make some game pieces. Once a game piece is introduced, it might be copied and iterated. Some game pieces are so common now um, that everyone uses them. Players may play solo or form teams of varying sizes. You could design a game piece that encourages or even requires group play. And then, as in Banks' as Azad, a player's ideologies are shaped and displayed by their choices. Um, okay, so here's our, our world building exercise for tonight. I'm gonna give you a little time to name and describe a game piece. What does it look like? How does a player interact with it? You know, you think of like the Monopoly hat, you think of an avatar in World of Warcraft, the kind of hologram creatures they play with on the Millennium Falcon in Star Wars, uh, the stones you use in Go, the different kinds of chess pieces, that there's some kind of physical manifestation of your game piece that you've designed. Um, and maybe this is related to some kind of ideology you have in this lifelike game we're playing. And then part two is to define its moveset. What does your game piece do and how does it interact with other pieces. So this is sort of the one and two are sort of the solo activity. I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes to do this right now. Um, and then we'll use the breakout group function so you can interact with another person who's here tonight and you can talk about, uh, we'll do part three there and we'll come back. But I wanna give you like five minutes, which I know is not a lot of time to world build, but I, I hopefully you're primed well. Um, take five minutes, do number one and number two, name and describe your game piece and then define its move set. And then we'll, uh, we'll give out the rest of the instructions. Um, thank you so much, good luck. Uh, world build away. While you're finishing up uh, your naming and describing and defining, I'll just uh, talk a little bit about what we'll do next. Uh, in a second, we'll use the, the breakout room function here, which will randomly pair you together, uh, mostly in twos, might be twos and threes, um, where I hope you'll say hi, introduce yourself, and then share your, your game piece with each other. Um, I, I think two parts, right? One is just to explain what your what your piece is and how it works. And then after you hear the other person's, so maybe think for a minute like how they might interact on our, our sort of giant interlocking game board, what they might do together if it's sort of played at the same time. Um, I, I for those of you who were last time you heard something similar, but I'll say like for me, the the mode of these kind of sharings is always um, like not critique, obviously, but like imagining alongside, right? Like what else does hearing about that person's make you think about? How can you add your imagination to theirs? Um, so I'll put you in breakout groups. It'll pop up a little thing and you'll have to join it. Um, it'll be kind of random. If you end up by yourself, uh, feel free to come back out into the main room. We'll add you somewhere else or you can chat with me. Um, but uh, but I hope you'll um, you'll find someone to interact with and get to meet another uh, world of today. So let me uh i'm gonna stop the share for a second because easier to do it with that down and we'll get going on that and we'll be in those for like about the same amount of time so we've got like maybe six seven minutes so we'll go reasonably fast give me just a second um, i hope you got to got to meet someone got to have a nice interaction um and uh and share your piece um while i'm talking if you'd like you'd like to put put it in the chat or talk a little bit about it just so people can share in sort of an ambient way Feel free. I'm going to give you some uh, some other ways to share here, but feel free if, and to do it in the chat now if you'd like, um, which is great. Uh, yeah, Alexander, thanks for getting us started. I love it. Um, it's really exciting. Um, so a couple ways beyond just sharing in the chat right now, if you would like to share uh, in a sort of wider way, if you tweet your game piece and whatever of your description you can in 280 characters, that's the ASU world build, we'll share it from there. You can also email it to me if you'd like to share it. Um, obviously, please feel free to send me other comments, feedback, whatever you'd like, stay in touch. If you'd like to be part of world building in some other way, let me know. Or, uh, we you know, really hope to keep expanding this sort of community and network. Um, you can also use this Google form here. Uh, that's really hard to write down while you're watching this, but if you put your phone at that QR code, it'll take you to the form and you can save that for later. Um, we'll collect them all there. Um, we're eventually going to try to pull together some of the stuff we're collecting and send it back out to people who participated. So I hope that uh, if you do want to want to uh, share with us, we'll share with other people. And then, of course, I hope you might use it in a story, artwork, a game, whatever else you're doing of your own. What kind of worldview is sort of implied by this you're making? How might it make other new ways of, of seeing sort of possible? Um, what other kinds of reality might your game piece make? Um, I, I'm going to leave this up here while I do final uh, goodbyes. Um, I just want to thank again to Victoria and Jeff and Karina and Jan for their hard work for the night together. It's been really fantastic. And I'm so excited to, uh, to have been here with you all. 
Um, we have our next event will be on 313. It'll be in person in Tempe and also online in this format. Um, so please join us for that. It will be stories about artificial intelligence versus stories by artificial intelligence, thinking about fiction and art in the age of AI, um, which seems like it's increased so much since we set up that event already even, um, that there'll be plenty to talk about. Uh, and then we'll have one more workshop on 327 uh, that will be about democracy, consensus, and community building, other ways of sort of dwelling together. Um, yeah, uh, Karina or Jan, will you put in the, uh, the chat for me, please? Thank you. Um, and then uh, in April, the science fiction writer Arcady Martin is going to come to campus uh, and speak to us, and that will also be uh, live streamed then. So we will have information on that really soon. I actually just confirmed the date with her today, so we will get information to that to you as soon as possible. Um, but thank you so much for being part of our, our World Building Workshop, for being part of this initiative, um, stay in community with us. Um, thank you again to Victoria and Jeff. Thank you all. Have a great night. Really appreciate you being here.